Hello, and welcome to the Deep and Durable Learning Podcast. This is the show for anyone who wants to learn how to think. Your brain was designed to think deeply, but thinking often loses out in the battle for educational efficiency. Real thinking gets pushed to the margins and eventually abandoned in far too many cases. I know there are many, including some educators, who don't believe that thinking can be taught. My students in my nearly 45 years in higher education, however, regularly told me on course evaluations that I taught them how to think. I believe I can help you with my proven strategies. In our quest this season to develop a learner's mind, we've accredited a set of dispositions that include focused exploration in pursuit of new ideas that will answer questions that we care about. In the last episode of this podcast, we dealt with childhood amnesia, and through that study, it became clear that we're doomed to forget if we try to remember facts. The key to lasting learning is the formation in our mind of logical categories that we call concepts. Concepts are patterns. Concepts are perceptions of regularities in objects, phenomena, sequences, causation, emotional states, you name it. Our brains are incorrigible pattern seekers, and that's what generates our concepts. We are hardwired by our neurobiology to seek patterns, and yet formal education seldom leverages this extraordinary ability. Instead, we're fed a steady diet of facts which we're expected to file, somehow, in our brains. The dominant filing method is brute force memorization. We all know from sad experience how well that works out. In today's podcast, I want to begin to operationalize conceptualization. I'm going to take apart the idea of concept formation so that seeking patterns becomes the basis for all your learning. Patterning must become your innate learning disposition because you'll continue to be assaulted with information and your brain will continue to be a leaky sieve unless you create the appropriate concept categories. Rest assured, you can conceptualize. You've already demonstrated your brilliance. In your early infancy, your rapidly expanding vocabulary was a source of familial pride, beginning with your first word. Concept formation was the basis for those attainments. You learn to recognize the face, the voice, and the mannerisms of your mother, and eventually you said mama to call for her. The specific attributes that allowed you to recognize your mother, regardless of the orientation of her face or how she was dressed on a particular day, was concept formation. Eventually you learned the concept of a woman and that your mother was a member of that category as well. Concept formation employs inductive logic. Induction moves from a collection of specifics to a generalization that expresses the relationship among all the specifics. The generalization is the conclusion of inductive reasoning. The concept of your mother and of the larger category that includes your mother among all women, are examples of inductive logic. In both cases, you collected specifics until you felt you were justified in recognizing a pattern. Let's try a different example. My wife and I recently acquired a betta, B-E-T-T-A, a type of fish, as part of our preschool curriculum. Let's suppose that we have only half-baked ideas about aquarium fish, perhaps from watching Jacques Cousteau 
many years ago, we became enchanted with schools of fish in the wild and decided to get another betta as a companion for our male. We're reasoning from specifics about fish, schools, and communities, and let's say we arrive at a generalization, and here it is. Fish need to be in communities to thrive. That's our inductive conclusion. Notice that the conclusion covers all fish, and that it includes other concepts, communities, and thriving. This conclusion covers more than the specifics that fed into it. For that reason, an inductive conclusion is often called an inductive leap, or in the vernacular we say that we jumped to a conclusion. That's always true with inductive reasoning because the conclusion covers more instances than the specifics that fed into it. Induction is a creative process. The conclusions are not inevitable. They may in fact be highly individualistic and not at all obvious to others. The creative aspect of induction can be a strength. Einstein's theory of relativity has been called an intuitive leap of immense proportions. In the words of another scientist, research is seeing what everyone has seen and thinking what no one else has thought. To think what no one else has thought may, however, put you straight into the world of crackpots. Take the example of the betta fish. If I think my male betta needs company to thrive, there's a good chance I'm going to be shocked. If I actually put another male betta in the same tank, there will be a duel to the death of at least one and perhaps both males. Even a female betta won't make it long term in the same tank with a male. A little more study would have surfaced two more important specifics. One, not all fish are schooling fish. And two, Betta fish are also known as Siamese fighting fish, and they're extremely territorial. My generalization about fish was based on an inadequate collection of specifics. That's where I started to go wrong. Our inductive generalizations can be tested using deductive logic. We are more familiar with deduction than induction. In our beta example, deduction would proceed like this. Major premise. Fish need to be in communities to thrive. Minor premise. Beta are fish. Conclusion? Therefore, beta need to be in communities to thrive. The major premise will be put to a test when I attempt to create a community of betta fish. In this instance, the death of one or more betta males will show me my major premise is incorrect. It would falsify my inductive conclusion. Suppose, however, that I had a huge aquarium with places betta males could hide from each other. The two males might coexist because the more aggressive fish couldn't locate the other one. In that instance, I wouldn't know my generalization was incorrect, and would go on thinking I had some fish wisdom. My inductive generalization would appear to be confirmed. It is still a flawed idea. I just don't know it. It isn't uncommon for flawed induction to go on undetected. Many people are, in fact, reluctant to put long-held notions to the test. Confirmation bias is characteristic of our siloed age. Many people don't engage with the views of those with whom they disagree out of fear of the counter-arguments they'll encounter. Louis Pasteur rightly said, the greatest derangement of the mind is to believe in something because one wishes it to be so. It is not intellectually honest to cherry-pick specifics that confirm my cherished notions. 
encountering contrary evidence improves my thinking. In the end, I may disagree with the other person, but my mind is aware of the specifics that he or she use in justifying their conclusions. There's nothing to fear in engagement. Augustine rightly observed that all truth is God's truth. The Christian disposition is supposed to be engagement with evidence and adversaries. Notice this admonition from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm quoting here from the Net Bible, N-E-T, starting with the second part of verse 4, where Paul says, The weapons of our warfare are not human weapons, but are made powerful by God for tearing down strongholds. We tear down arguments and every arrogant obstacle that's raised up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to make it obey Christ. Much more could be said, but let's move back to operationalizing induction. Neuroscientist Daniel Bohr, in his book, The Ravenous Brain, says, Neuroscience, quote, explains our insatiable search for meaning, end quote. The reality is we're, we're never satisfied with just the what. We want the so what. We want to know how and why. We search for patterns because we're wired by our creator to this end. Pattern seeking will be rewarded because the universe overflows with patterns and they all lead us back to our Creator. See Romans chapter 1. Induction is not linear, and it is not rule-based. These two realities make it challenging for the lecture-based batch processing of large number of students in traditional education systems to accommodate. Consequently, most students and adult learners have only conceptualized subliminally. We all have categories in our minds, but it isn't obvious how they were created. One lesson from this season of podcasts is that conceptualization is aided and abetted by focused exploration. The more specifics we encounter that are relevant to answering a question we care about, the more likely it is that we will recognize the right pattern in the specifics. My initial beta fish hypothesis example serves to show the weakness that can result from an inadequate collection of specifics. I like the image of a ravenous mind. We intentionally and joyfully seek out specific examples to enrich or revise our existing conceptual categories. I would call this enlargement. Without initially passing judgment, I accumulate relevant specifics. It isn't wrong to have a hunch about how the specifics relate to create a pattern, but I would hold the emerging inductive generalization loosely. I withhold judgment until I know more. In the process of enlargement, we will encounter ideas or examples that don't quite seem to fit, and we don't dismiss them out of hand. Indeed, the fact that they don't fit neatly may be the catalyst for a major revision of our existing concept or for the creation of an entirely new concept. In addition, however, Ideas or examples that I previously bundled together may need to be removed. Perhaps they belong in a different category. Perhaps I was mistaken about the nature of the idea. Perhaps I've misrepresented something as evidence, or I've discovered the source is not trustworthy. This can happen in parallel to enlargement, and I call it conceptual pruning. The tree of knowledge grows best when it's pruned. Or, to put it differently, 
If we allow clutter to accumulate, we can obscure the pattern that we're trying to discern. Educational curriculum and teachers can accelerate the process of conceptualization. They can do this by introducing the student to a wide range of examples, including, on purpose, some that don't quite fit. Asking students probing questions is another productive strategy. What educators must not do is what they usually do, which is to simply deliver the products of their own conceptualizing. Concepts are abstractions that are created to account for patterns in a group of specifics. Delivering an abstraction to a would-be learner undercuts the very mechanism that the brain uses to create and thus to retain the abstraction. It's like helping a butterfly out of its chrysalis. You kill the butterfly. The students struggle with specifics until they personally see the pattern as essential to their lasting learning. Aha moments are the fruit of seeing. They are not optional. Now let's try another example. Scotland is where my gray family roots are. This summer, my wife and I spent a month exploring Scotland. I say exploring because we intended to learn about the country and its people, including my forebearers. To achieve this objective, we shied away from packaged tours so we could actually explore without a rigid itinerary. We used public transportation, rail and buses exclusively, and we stayed in nine different Airbnbs with Scottish hosts so we could live with Scottish people and converse with them. As a result of focused exploration, we now have a conceptual grid about the country and its people and its industries. We remember lots of specifics from nearly all the geographical regions of the country. Long before the trip, I knew a tiny bit about the clans and clan warfare. Indeed, a website called The Scotsman says, quote, there was no shortage of blood spilled as Scotland's ancient clans fought for reputation, wealth, territory, and survival with countless lives lost as a result. End of quote. So here's my initial concept of a Scotsman. Scottish people are insular and combative. That's the Conclusion I came to from a very superficial acquaintance with Scotland. Well, when we made the trip, we entered Scotland at the Glasgow airport, and we got on a bus to travel downtown. As the bus made stops, I noticed that every person who got off the bus thanked the driver. And I'm thinking, that's odd. He must know a number of these folks, or... Perhaps he's just uh, an unusually friendly fellow. Upon arriving at our first Airbnb, we found our host to be very welcoming. Probably just part of running a rental, I thought. The next morning, my wife and I found that a good breakfast had been prepared for us, even though the listing said nothing about it. Indeed, we'd bought some breakfast items at a grocery at the Glasgow airport. Hmm... I took a walk into downtown Glasgow to get a SIM card for use in the UK. The college-age techie who helped us asked us what we were there to see and made some recommendations. Very friendly and helpful. Hmm. We took a walk to explore part of the city and wanted a better, big-scale map than Google. So we pulled out a paper map in our guidebook. Within two minutes, someone stopped and asked us if we needed directions. Now, Glasgow is the largest city in Scotland with a metro population of over 1,861,000 people. Hmm. And this experience was repeated almost without exception 
over all of Scotland. So, I have a new inductive conclusion. Scots are friendly and helpful people. This big idea was forged by a wonderful experience with lots of delightful specifics. We've just begun the restoration of pattern recognition as the focal point of deep and durable learning. I say restoration because you were brilliant as a baby. The concepts you formed then and since have ordered your world and allowed you to communicate your ideas, but you can still grow. New elevations of attainment are in reach when you make concept formation deliberate. Join me in two weeks for Insight Through Induction.